In the last lecture, we introduced the uh, book of Ruth and got through the first five verses of uh, chapter one, namely the prologue uh, in which the scene is set and the problem, the family tragedy uh, occurs in which Naomi lost her husband and both of her sons. Now, uh, in the uh, rest of uh, chapter one, we're going to see the beginnings of the resolution of this problem. Uh, the rest of chapter 1 is really in two sections, verses 6 through 19a, uh, and then uh, 19b through 22, uh, when Naomi and Ruth enter into Bethlehem. So, first, uh, verses 6 through 19a. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt uh, with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you uh, to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. Uh, if I should say I have hope, uh, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following me, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. <coughs> now, um, Naomi is so bitter and depressed because of what has happened to her family, that she not only fails to perceive the hand of God in the events of her life, except the hand of God in ultimately behind all of the problems, but she becomes angry and bitter against God. Now, verse 6 has told us that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. This reveals that God was sovereign over uh, the entire uh, famine, and now in his grace and mercy, he is showing compassion to his people. Now, just need to stop here for just a moment. The name of God is mentioned uh, 23 times in the book, uh, mostly by the various uh, characters in as part of their discourse or narrative. Yahweh, uh, occurs 17 times, Elohim four times, once referring to Chamash, the uh, god of the Moabites, and Shaddai twice. But only two times uh, are God's actual actions mentioned, or is God referred to by the narrator. By the narrator. In verse 6 here, uh, where it said, the Lord had visited his people and given them food, and again in chapter 4, verse 13, where it says that the Lord gave Ruth uh, conception. Um, but notice, uh, in, even in those two times, God is not acting overtly, uh, miraculously, supernaturally. Uh, God never speaks in this book. Uh, he is acting in natural ways. I mean, one could say, well, okay, the famine ended because the rains came, and so on. You, it, people tend to look at these things very naturally. But what the book is saying here is that 
God is behind everything. He is, and as we will see, he is active and present behind the scenes continually uh, throughout the book of Ruth. Now, so, uh, but Naomi does not see this. Uh, she does not realize that God's compassion uh, applies to her. Instead, she says, uh, in verse 13, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And she continues this antipathy uh, towards God, even after arriving in Bethlehem, as we will discuss in a few minutes, when she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, uh, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity on me? Now, despite her bitterness against God, and that is, by the way, something we all tend to do. When we suffer setback, hardship, uh, pain, suffering, loss, that turns us, that tends to turn most of us inward, that we only are looking at our circumstances um, and we're not seeing the bigger picture. Um, but nevertheless, it's very interesting. She's bitter towards God because of what's happened to her, but she still shows compassion to her daughters-in-law. Now, she realizes that she does not have the ability to provide new husbands for Orpah and Ruth, and that if her daughters-in-law continue with her to Bethlehem, the prospects of their finding husbands would be fairly remote uh, because of the fact that they would be despised Moabitesses, foreigners in the land of Israel. And therefore, Naomi strongly urges them to return to their homes. And she wants also to spare them her fate. I mean, she believes the hand of the Lord has uh, gone out against me, and so if Orpah, if you and Ruth continue with me, you can expect the hand of the Lord to be against you also. Um, now, Naomi is clearly putting her daughters-in-law, uh, their well-being first, because if they follow her advice, then that would mean that Naomi will have to return to Bethlehem alone, which would be very difficult, particularly in that culture, in that time, and in that place. But um, she blesses her daughters-in-law, saying, the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of a husband. Um, and she called on the Lord uh, to bless them, and saying, May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Now, the word translated deal kindly is the Hebrew word chesed. And as I mentioned in the introduction, chesed is a relationship act of loving commitment. Typically, a voluntary act of extraordinary mercy or compassion. In other words, above and beyond the call of duty. Normally by somebody in, in a more powerful position who could choose to do otherwise. Uh, now, over two-thirds of the use of hesed in the Old Testament are God's acts of hesed uh, to his people. Um, and uh, in the story of Ruth, uh, God's uh, hesed are referred to uh, in, uh, in Ruth 1, verse 8, um, where it says uh, that, pardon me, Ruth 1, 8, where it says uh, that may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have uh, dealt with uh, uh, the dead and with me. And also, in uh, chapter 2, verse 20, uh, where uh, Naomi is now blessing uh, Boaz, who has shown kindness. Uh, and uh, so, uh, the, uh, I mean, God, uh, in, in um, you, you need to, we need to understand a little more about this word chesed. Um, God is beginning to show this by providing food. For his people in, in verse 6. Ruth is clearly demonstrating Hesed in her commitment to, to Naomi. Um, and interestingly enough, the only human beings that are explicitly uh, 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 said uh, to uh, uh, exhibit Hesed are uh, Orpah once in verse 8 and Ruth twice in 
verse 8, and again in chapter 3, verse 10. So, ironically, the only two human beings who are explicitly said to uh, exhibit hesed are Moabites. Um, and uh, again, this is one of the interesting subtleties uh, uh, of this book of Ruth. Um, now, Hesed was a Hebrew concept based largely on their covenant, their clan and family relationships with God and with each other. But what's, again, interesting in the book of Ruth is that uh, the Hesed framework in Ruth seems uh, to rest not on a covenant basis, but on a cosmic or theological one. In other words, its roots relate more to Yahweh's role as king of the universe rather than as Israel's covenant God. And, and therefore, in verse 8, Naomi petitions that God repay Orpah and Ruth for their said, although neither Orpah nor Ruth were members of Israel's covenant community. They were foreigners. Her plea is assuming that God rewards all peoples, not just Israelites, for the Hesed that we do. Um, and it's assuming, therefore, that God is a God of Hesed, which is clearly true and is made very clear throughout the rest of the Bible. Um, consequently, this concept of Hesed should particularly characterize Christians and the church. Because, after all, the church is in relationship. It is a family with each other and has been adopted into God's family. Um, and so, uh, you know, Naomi called upon God to bless uh, Orpah and Ruth because of the hesed they did uh, to their husbands. Uh, well, that should apply all the more to us uh, because as uh, 1 John 4 says, we love because Christ first loved us. Think of all he has done for us. How can we not live like that in our relationship with others? Now, in verse 14, Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye and followed Naomi's advice and returned to her home and her people and her gods. But it says Ruth clung to her. Now, the Bible does not condemn Orpah for doing this. I mean, after all, Naomi had herself suggested it and, and urged uh, Orpah and Ruth to do this. But by Orpah's leaving, that makes Ruth... Uh, appear all the more positive. And interestingly, when it says that Ruth clung to her, the same word is used in Genesis 2, verse 24, where it says, uh, regarding marriage, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast or cling to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That shows the depth of Ruth's loyalty, affection, and attachment to Naomi. Uh, now, Naomi had, had painted a grim picture of life if the daughter-in-law stayed and followed her back to uh, Judah and Bethlehem. He, she was painting a picture of widowhood and childlessness. Um, and But Ruth decided to remain, uh, and think about this, this is a complete turnaround for Ruth, physically leaving her own home and going to a new land, emotionally, geographically, and spiritually. Uh, and so Ruth is abandoning her own family, her land, and committing herself. Uh, uh, as John Piper points out, uh, when it says that, uh, when she says, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more, if anything but death parts me from you. What John Piper points out is she's abandoning her own family, uh, her land, uh, her, the god of, of Moab, and committing herself never to marry a non-relative. Because if she married a non-relative, Ruth's commitment to Naomi's family would be lost. And when she says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried, meant that she, would, she was committing never to return home uh, again, even if Naomi died. Uh, her commitment was total. This is absolutely amazing. Um, 
She even invoked the name of the Lord, uh, his covenant name, Yahweh, in calling down a curse on herself if anything but death parted her from Naomi. I mean, she was confirming by her actions her true conversion to Yahweh, and she was act similar to what Rahab, uh, her actions in Judges 2, and James' discussion of true versus dead faith in James 2. This should challenge the church. Um, you know, most of us will never have to make uh, the choices that Ruth had to make, to live in a foreign land as an outsider uh, with a different background among people who generally hate you. But the challenge to us is, how can we, who do not face a situation and choice that she faced, but live in our own familiar culture and familiar circumstances, how can we live as radically committed to Christ and others as Ruth did. I think this calls for deep reflection on our part as Christians, both individually and churches collectively, to make this commitment to Christ and others, namely, as Jesus said, the whole Bible comes down to two commands. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you think about it, how radical that is. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, that means we are to devote the same amount of time, energy, thought, money, planning, and everything else to loving others that we lavish now on ourselves. That's what Ruth was doing. She is a tremendous example uh, for us, and I think, unfortunately, in many cases, a convicting example. But we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, so we should be able to do this. Let us reflect upon this. Now, then the last part of chapter 1, verses 19b through verse 22, uh, Naomi and Ruth enter uh, Bethlehem. These verses say this, And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, Naomi's bitterness and depression are on full display when she entered Bethlehem. And her statement in uh, verse 20 uh, is actually a play on words or a play on names. Remember, the name Naomi comes from the root meaning pleasant. And so, uh, and Mara means bitter. So what she's saying is, don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. Uh, and then, because the Lord has dealt bitterly against me. And she says, I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Once again, this reveals how bitter circumstances tend to warp our perspective. They turn us inward so that we only focus on our pain and our loss. And five times in verses 20 and 21, Naomi focuses on herself by using the words, I and me. But the irony of her statement, remember, Ruth is told, the story of Ruth, by a master storyteller with subtlety uh, and irony. Uh, but the irony of the statement, I went away full, is that it is essentially untrue. Yes, she left uh, uh, Bethlehem with her husband and her sons, but they left because of a famine, which was a disaster for the entire family. So they weren't full. They were leaving because they didn't have any food. Uh, and her statement, the Lord has brought me back empty is also clearly untrue. Notice, she does not even acknowledge the fact that Ruth is with her, despite Ruth's amazing loyalty, affection, and attachment uh, to her, all of which were expressed by Ruth's, uh, at the cost of Ruth's own well-being. She would have been much better off to go back, as Orpah did. But she went, became a stranger in a strange land, 
because of her attachment uh, to Naomi. Um, and see, the amazing commitment that Ruth has in, in this story is indirectly hinted at uh, in verse 22 when, it, when she is called Ruth the Moabite, or in some verse, the Moabitess. That is the way she is characteristically going to be called throughout the rest of the book. Um, even though she's called Ruth the Moabite, even though she clearly converted to belief in Yahweh and is now manifestly a follower of Yahweh. The other ironic aspect uh, of Naomi's statements uh, and the fact that bitterness tends to blind us to God's greater plan and the small ways that he is working that plan out uh, is the fact that uh, Naomi neither forgot nor rejected God she invoked his chesed when blessing Orpah and Ruth and urging them to return to their own homes. Now, she is not blaming uh, natural causes or circumstances uh, for her problems. She's specifically uh, citing God as the cause of her misfortune. That reveals that she had a very high view of God's sovereignty, kind of like what Job said. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Now, Naomi does not add, blessed be the name of the Lord. She's complaining. But she's recognizing God's hand is behind this. He is sovereign. So she has a high view of God's sovereignty. But her problem is that she does not have a broad enough view of God's sovereignty. And that is the problem for most of us. We tend to focus on the problem. And we don't Ask the question, God, I don't know what's going on here. I don't like what's going on here. But what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me? Why are you doing this? You know, everything ultimately is a part of God's plan to grow us up and conform us into the image of Jesus Christ, according to Romans 8, uh, verse 29. Um, you see, she's blind to what God has already done in her life. Namely, that God has given her Ruth. And at the end of the book, uh, the, the people will say uh, that Ruth loves you, Naomi, and is more valuable than seven sons would be. She's blind to the fact that God has ended the famine and has visited his, his people and given uh, them food. Uh, and so she's blind to the fact that it is God who protected her and Ruth two vulnerable, unaccompanied women on their journey from Moab to Bethlehem. And she's blind to the fact that they arrived, as verse 22 tells us, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, the barley harvest was in April, and the wheat harvest uh, followed in May. This means she just happened. Again, it's one of these little coincidences. It's not a coincidence. She just happened to arrive uh, at the time where they would have two full months of being able to glean and obtain food. Those are just some of the things that God already has done. Naomi, of course, uh, could not know what God soon would be doing in and through her situation to bring about the redemption of Naomi's property through Boaz, to bring about the marriage of Boaz and Ruth, and the birth of Obed, who would become the grandfather of King David and ultimately would lead to the Messiah himself. In other words, that's the broader picture that Naomi was blind to. You see, grief and bitterness tend to take away our trust in God and uh, make us forget that uh, all things work together for good to those who are called according to God's purpose, uh, to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We need to keep that in mind because as God is showing us through the story of the book of Ruth, he's dealing with a natural tragedy, loss of the family, famine, and so on. He does not make a personal appearance. He does not speak. And all of his actions are behind the scenes through natural means. And yet 
he is present and orchestrating these events. And, you know, Naomi does not see this. And the thing that we need to think about is when we are going through the ringer of life, um, we need to try to recognize that our natural tendency is to become bitter and inward focused exactly like Naomi. But as Ruth, the story of Ruth, tells us, we need to reflect on the fact that God is in there. Remember, Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He didn't say, it's only the good times. Um, and uh, as, as we will see, God is only two actions in the book. Chapter 1, verse 6, and uh, in chapter 4, where he gives conception to uh, Ruth. Those are the only two things God is, explic is explicitly said to do. A lot of people may think that, well, that means that God will intervene from time to time, but then there's long stretches where he's not involved. No. The book of Ruth is telling us he is involved in everything. All of these things. It was not a coincidence that they happened to arrive in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay? They, ar uh, they arrived at that time. That's the hand of God. He is involved behind the scenes. We don't see him. We don't hear him. But he is working out his will. And if we have the broader perspective of God's sovereignty, it will help us get through the hard times because he is with us uh, and is using these things to deepen us and strengthen us in the faith and ultimately bring glory to himself. So when we are confronted with hard times, we should resist the tendency to shake our fist at God or push back against him, but rather draw closer to him. That is counter the way our natural self is. But remember, as a Christian, you've been bought with a price. You're not your own. He's given you a new heart. He's given you the mind of Christ, and he's given you the Holy Spirit, and he has given you the body. And he's using all things, both good and bad, to work for our ultimate good. We may not see it in this life, but he's using it, and he is with us. Those are the things Naomi did not see. Now, uh, beginning in the next chapter, we're going to see very interestingly what God, how God orchestrates things to begin the process of resolving this tremendous tragedy that has occurred.